everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today, introducing you to ICCR's program on food justice. We hope you find it helpful as you look to work on the issues of food justice with ICCR members. This webinar is intended to be an introduction to our food program, highlighting the program's goals, focus sectors, asks, or requests for remaking of these companies. And you'll be hearing from me in addition to a few ICCR members who are working on this program. As a lot of ICCR's work is learned best by doing, we really hope that this webinar will, feel, will make you feel comfortable to just jump in. If you have questions um, as they come up, just use the chat or the question feature on your panel and we'll get to them during our Q&A session. On this first slide here, you have my contact information. Um, the schedule for a monthly call happens every fourth Tuesday of the month and a couple of slides in, you'll actually see the, uh, the entire schedule there for the rest of, of the year. And I encourage you all to sign up to our food justice group on the ICCR's members area where you can get all of our, our information on the group's um, actions and engagements. I don't think we see your slides. There you go. Great. So why are we doing this work in the first place? Why are we engaged with, with food companies? What are the risks that companies face in the broad sector? So this, uh, this slide gives you a, a high level example of some of the, the risk factors that companies face, physical, regulatory, and reputational risk. And of course, they will be different depending on the issue that, that we are raising with companies, but this is just a, a high level look. So for example, uh, climate change is um, a great risk factor across many of our issues at ICCR, food issues, water issues, and of course, um, climate change. And the risks that it poses to water quality, uh, water pollution, soil health, um, as examples. And then on the regulatory side, what are some of the, um, the environmental or health regulations, their labeling regulations and, and taxes like the carbon tax or the soda tax that could have some impacts on, on companies. And of course, reputational, uh, changing consumer preferences, NGO campaigns that are geared um, and targeted and target to, uh, to different companies can have an impact as well, all of which contribute to uh, financial risk to the companies. So we try to raise up these risks um, to companies as much as we can, uh, making the business case for why they should address the issues that we bring to the table. On this slide, you'll see our program focus. So overall, our high level goal on food justice is ensuring an equitable, accessible and sustainable food system that nourishes both people and planet. We focus on objectives that minimize public health threats such as antibiotic resistance and obesity, secure natural resources and mitigate the impact of climate change. In addition, we are also seeking to protect the rights of workers who produce our food. To get to these objectives, we primarily engage with companies in the food and agriculture sector, including restaurants and retailers. Our members, believe it or not, are engaging over 40 companies on food alone. In these engagements, we are asking companies to adopt comprehensive policies that will set the company up to assess their risks, maximize their contribution to food justice, and report on the progress they are making. In today's webinar, you'll you'll hear about the following focus areas. Eliminating routine antibiotic use in the livestock supply chain, increasing access to nutrition, halting deforestation and increasing sustainable ag sourcing, uh, halving food waste, and advancing worker rights in the food supply chain. So just a few words on why, why these focus areas. Food justice in the area of sustainable food can be a very broad topic. So we narrowed are focused to five topics. I know five topics doesn't seem like we've narrowed anything, um, but nonetheless, we have narrowed to, uh, to five topics. These are issues that are important to our members uh, via our prioritization survey and issues that are important to protecting workers, public health, and sustaining the earth's natural resources. In addition, these are topics we thought we could affect some change on via our corporate engagements. Importantly, we have developed great partners in this work. Those partners we collaborate with to bring in an inside outside strategy approach on these issues. So on the inside, working as investors um, with these companies and holding our, our engagements. And on the outside, uh, working with our partners um, as they're developing their research, as they're developing their campaigns, 
um, and using um, often the reputational risk that they're creating um, in our corporate engagement companies. Today, we also see that these topics are ripe for actual change, and we will get into some of that in the description of each issue area as we move forward. So on corporate goals, at a high level, here's what the stewardship journey of companies on food ought to look like. And I know that um, that very colorful graphic, it's a little bit hard to read um, some of the um, the the indicators and the key insights for what sustainable food is and i'll be happy to share a bigger version of that um, as i send you all out materials so we want the companies to be ecologically responsible in terms of again preserving our soil and our water we want a fair and accessible food system that treats our workers fairly and healthy food for consumers and importantly reducing food waste i also want to bring to your attention iccr's hierarchy of impact that pyramid scheme that you see there. And this is our own benchmarking scheme. It's applicable to any issue at ICCR, so not just on food, on how companies ought to address both environmental and social issues. We're looking for companies to acknowledge risks and issues in their 10K, for example. We're asking them to develop a policy to manage that risk, set goals and targets to put that policy into action, develop metrics to measure their progress on achieving goals, and compare themselves to peers. At the end of the day, we want them to be able to demonstrate that all of the policies and practices they're putting in place is having a positive impact in their, in their backyard and in their operations. Throughout the process of engagement, we want to ensure that the company is being transparent by publicly disclosing information and that they are engaging with different stakeholders, be it NGOs, investors, and especially affected communities. I also wanted to highlight the UN SDGs, especially SDG goal two, which is on ending hunger, achieving food security and improving nutrition, in addition to promoting sustainable ag. And so this goal amongst a couple of others, as you see on this slide, touch on the work um, that we do on food. All stakeholders need to contribute towards achieving the SDGs. And our members have been raising this um, in, their, in their engagements and raising it to me in terms of uh, making sure we lift this up in our food program. As I mentioned, we're engaging more than 40 companies in this work. And here's a quick snapshot of the companies that we engaged with in the last shareholder season. And more than likely, almost all of these engagements will continue on for 2018. So if you hold any of these companies and are interested in joining these engagements, please sign up to the ICCR database. If you are an affiliate member and don't have access to the database, you can feel free to contact me if you're interested. And the same goes for, for any issue area at ICCR. So lots of opportunities um, to engage here. Now we will turn our attention to diving a bit deeper on our different program focus areas. Austin Wilson is the Environmental Health Program Manager at ASISO and will take us through our work on eliminating routine antibiotic use in the livestock supply chain. Austin? Thank you so much, Nadira. I'm, as many of you know, I'm sure, antibiotics are a foundation of modern medicine, a miracle treatment for bacterial infections. The more that they're used, however, the less they work. Scientists have known about this effect for several decades, but in the past several years, we've begun to see the real world impacts of this take shape. We have a long way to go before we ensure that antibiotics continue to work in the future. And this is gonna require changes both in human medicine and in animal medicine. And that's because antibiotics, including those that are important to human medicine, are frequently used in animal agriculture for rapid growth promotion and to prevent illness in animals that are living in cramped and unhealthy conditions. The antibiotics are frequently given to animals while they're still healthy to prevent them from becoming sick because other best practices are not used. Right now, the FDA estimates that and animal agriculture accounts for 70% of current U.S. antibiotic use and the majority of medically important antibiotic use. Um, so the overuse of antibiotics in the meat industry is linked to the rise of antibiotic resistant superbugs in the U.S. and across the world. Right now, according to conservative estimates from the CDC, antibiotic resistance causes 2 million infections and 23,000 deaths per year. And those are very conservative estimates. 
this public health concern has prompted ICCR members to call on restaurant chains and meat producers to develop sourcing policies that restrict antibiotic use in food production to therapeutic use only and to begin cutting down on the amount of medically important antibiotics that they're using. So investors are seeing this risk that global awareness of this issue in the public is leading to shifts in consumer demand. There's also uh, physical risks where antibiotics will stop working um, in food production and regulatory scrutiny leading to uh, state policies that are stricter and possibly uh, federal, pol federal policies that are stricter. So we are encouraging companies to get ahead of these risks and develop responsible policies now. Next slide, please. Ah, thank you. So here's a list of companies that we will continue to or newly engage in the 2018 shareholder season. We've had some success with companies on eliminating routine use of medically important antibiotics in chicken um, or eliminating all use of medically important antibiotics in chicken, which is something that chicken producers have been able to do quickly. Uh, we've secured commitments from McDonald's, Wendy's, and KFC, for example, uh, on chicken, um, as well as uh, Starbucks and, um, and others. Uh, but we still have more work to do. Um, we've had this great momentum on chicken, but it is harder uh, for producers to transition their operations in beef and pork. There are some unique challenges in those. Those animals live longer on the farms. Um, they're more susceptible to certain illnesses, and they tend to, when, when they do get sick, they tend to require the use of the same antibiotics that are used in humans. Um, but of course, as organic uh, meat production and other European meat production shows, we can use a fraction, a small fraction of the antibiotics that we use now if these best practices are implemented. So we are asking companies to set global sourcing targets with timelines for beef and pork raised with the ask of no use of antibiotics for growth promotion and no regular or repeated use for disease prevention. Um, we have one of our major successes this year was with Yum Brands, which owns KFC, a major chicken-based restaurant chain in the U.S. And this, this company was one of the last major restaurant chains that hadn't taken action uh, on their chicken. And, but we had a number of allies that were engaging it. Uh, NGOs, grassroots advocacy groups had been calling attention to KFC uh, for, for about a year. And we filed a shareholder resolution to highlight the reputational damage that the company was suffering and how they were not in touch with their millennial consumers and that they were culpable for this dire global problem. And uh, Yum, uh, Yum Brands uh, was very concerned about the resolution, didn't want it to go to a vote. And we engaged in several months of dialogues uh, before the day before their proxy was printed, they came to an agreement with them that they would source uh, chicken raised without medically important antibiotics, um, that they would announce that within a few months and implement the policy fully uh, within a year and a half. So that was a great success that we had this spring. Right now, we are focusing on prompting McDonald's to become a leader on beef and pork, the first major restaurant chain uh, of their size to really grapple with reducing antibiotics in those areas. And we are also engaging Sanderson Farms, one of the major chicken producers in the country. We've mostly focused downstream on the consumer-facing brands, restaurant chains, uh, fast food restaurants. But Sanderson Farms produces 7% of the country's chicken, and they totally deny the science of this issue. They put out a lot of advertising that claims that antibiotic resistance is not a problem and that it's all a bunch of, bunch of baloney. And so we are raising, we are highlighting the risks of this, of this, of these actions. And last January, our resolution with Sanderson was supported by 30% of shares. It shows that we have, that we're reaching a lot of people on this, and that it's only a matter of time before Sanderson um, has to throw in the towel and join the 21st century. <laughs> and that's our antibiotics work. Great, thanks, Austin. Next up, Donna Meyer, Director of Shareholder Advocacy at Mercy Investment Services, will talk to us about our work on nutrition. 
Donna. Sorry. Um, for those of you who are history buffs, um, you probably know that since the beginning of the history of mankind, people have been concerned about hunger and malnutrition. That was our main food concern. But in the last 20, 30 years, that it ch has changed dramatically, both due to the changes in the lifestyle, the Western lifestyle that's more sanitary, and due to the way we eat and the kinds of foods that are available to us. Today, overweight or obesity outstrips um, malnutrition, even in underdeveloped or, or uh, low-income countries. So it's a worldwide phenomena. And I think there are various estimates, but close to 200 million children probably are in some way impacted um, by uh, obesity and a lesser number by um, malnutrition. So we really, in our food work, have, I guess you'd call, a double edge to our work. We need to address the obesity crisis. And then in, in specific cases, we do need to also think about uh, fortification and addressing um, malnutrition problems. If you look at the picture on the slide that's up right now, you see in the bright red and bright orange that this advertising, it's not just what's produced, but it's also what's pushed at us through the media that advertising is mostly for snacks rather than for fruits and vegetables and things that we consider healthy foods. On the right-hand side, you see the impact of that, the financial cost of obesity. And I think you all read in the papers, too, that um, the obesity crisis is blamed for our diabetic, um, the huge rise in the number of diabetics we're seeing, as well as other heart disease and so forth. And so it's a huge cost to society. It's causing this huge cost. Thus, governments have gotten involved in, they're introducing new taxes, like on sugar-sweetened beverages. You've probably heard Mexico has one, and some of the states and cities in the United States have passed these taxes. And we, as investors, are getting involved by working with companies, public companies, um, to try to convince them that the public is interested in healthier foods and that it's a risk to them if they don't address this interest in the, in the, among the public. And um, we're trying to get them to think about not only making foods healthier so that the junk foods have less salt and sugar and fat, but also think about what they're advertising, especially to children, um, because children are very vulnerable to these ads. So on the next slide is a list of the companies that we're currently working with. And you see there are really three sectors. One is food and beverage. They're the manufacturers. And the manufacturers, we're trying to convince them to make their foods healthier. So a good example of that for, is, uh, say, Nestle. They are a standout in that sector. They not only set targets for themselves for the year 2020 and the year 2025 in terms of what they want to attain, but they track on the individual products and overall products whether they're indeed removing salt, removing sugar, adding more whole wheats, and so forth. So we're, we're pushing all the companies to do that. There is a access to nutrition index that we can use as a guide. They do a nice job every two years. They publish and they, um, they uh, review these companies' practices. And so we're able to use that as shareholders to help guide the companies and talk with them about the public interest in healthier food. And the restaurant companies we try to encourage them to offer healthier menu items. And I think this coming year, we're also going to try to push them to um, somehow measure whether they're, they are offering healthier items and whether people are selecting healthier items. 
um, a couple years ago, for example, with Dynequity and I think Dynequity, I'm not sure about Wendy's, um, both of them, I believe, I know Dynequity agreed to remove all um, sweetened beverages from the kids' menus. So now there is no beverage in the kids' menu. And they have to select off the list. And they've changed the list of, put to, of beverages kids can select from so that they list water, orange juice, milk, before they list the sugar-sweetened beverages. So, and then on the retail sector, um, that's like grocery stores, of course, and we, they all produce their own products. So on the products they produce, we push them to be sure the labels are very clear so the customer can compare products and compare a healthy product and discover which product offers the best value. We also push them to um, position the products appropriately. For example, offer a healthy checkout lane so mothers can take children along shopping and go through the healthy checkout lane where the children will be exposed to water and fruits instead of candy and the kinds of things you see in most checkout lanes. So that's the array of work in the access to nutrition and we certainly invite more investors to get involved with us in this work. Great, thanks so much Donna for sharing. And now we'll turn things over to uh, Frank Sherman, Executive Director, 7th Generation Interfaith Coalition for Responsible Investment, who will share the work he's helped to lead on deforestation and the connection to sustainable ag. Frank? Hi, good, good morning, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you fine. Okay, good. Okay, deforestation, this is uh, uh, a more recent focus area for ICCR, although some of our members have been involved in this for some time. Deforestation is a um, uh, in the supply chain due to various uh, commodities that uh, companies we own uh, have these risks in their supply chain. First of all, deforestation accounts for over 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions and also contributes to biodiversity loss, uh, soil erosion, disruption of, of rainfall patterns, uh, in addition to uh, impacting community uh, land conflicts as well as forced labor. A lot of workers on plantations or migrant workers and we know that that's a hot spot for abuse. So of, uh, if you look at total deforestation, um, the impact on climate change, for example, is even larger than all of transportation combined. So there's a lot of focus on auto emissions, truck, air, airplane, uh, 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 ships. You combine all of that, it's, it's less than deforestation. So it's really a, an, um, somewhat underlooked uh, or underexposed area. And it's also felt that deforestation is a easier thing to solve. Uh, the solutions are there for uh, solving deforestation much easier uh, than in the transportation sector. So uh, that's why now in uh, recent efforts and in the Paris Agreement, deforestation was a real highlight. Uh, so if we look at the drivers of deforestation, commercial agriculture, drives uh, at least two thirds of tropical deforestation globally. And half of this commercial agricultural deforestation is done illegally. So you see forest clearance uh, uh, and, and peat, peatland clearance, which is a big carbon sink uh, happening through um, uh, use of fire. And, and this causes multiple problems. Uh, most of the uh, uh, commercial agriculture is done in Asia, but it's also moving more to Africa, and it's also done, of course, in Latin America. The major commodities we're talking about are palm, soy, uh, timber, and pulp, as well as cattle. Cattle being the major one, especially 
in South America. But in Asia, we're talking mainly uh, palm and sometimes, uh, well, certainly timber. And uh, when Nadira mentioned the risk to companies, certainly deforestation is, has all three risks. The uh, physical risk of uh, supply, if uh, your supply is coming from illegally cleared forests, then you have a risk of uh, uh, supply reliability. You have uh, reputational risk as uh, the public becomes more aware of uh, uh, products that contained commodities based on deforestation and forced labor. And then thirdly, regulatory risk as more regulations come in in the use of uh, sustainable palm and sustainable uh, timber and pulp and sustainable cattle eventually. So all these risks exist. Uh, and conserving forest, uh, they already have good practices for conserving forest and stabilizing soil so, soil. so this is not a problem looking for a solution. This is a problem that has a solution, like many of the climate change issues, uh, but we have to find and, and drive the, the movement towards that solution. Uh, so uh, next slide, uh, please, Nadira. <clears throat> the, um, these are a list of companies um, and uh, our ask. Our ask is for companies to develop a comprehensive cross-commodity uh, policy and implementation plan to eliminate deforestation and related human rights issues from the company's supply chain. Uh, so this, uh, this commitment includes use of third parties to verify their uh, commodities come from uh, uh, areas that are not deforest illegally and have um, uh, respect labor rights and land rights. Uh, these certification processes uh, and, and bodies like the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, uh, reporting bodies like CDP and others, um, these are public platforms for implementing your your process. Um, and we asked them to develop, we're, we're moving from, we started this work in palm oil and we've moved to the other commodities like cattle and soy and timber. Uh, so we talk about in multi or cross commodity commitments. And we're moving that further to, to ask them to have a, policy, a holistic policy around sustainable agriculture which goes beyond deforestation to include water, soil, uh, and labor rights, use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, et cetera. So it's, uh, we evolve as, as, as Nadir talked about the pyramid of you know, hierarchy of impact. We, we start with the soy typically, and we start to get them more involved in taking a more holistic view of their supply chain. If you look at the sectors, we uh, hit the, um, the commodity producers as well as the retail uh, sector, Walmart being a leader here. Uh, and uh, uh, ADM and commodity area ADM is thought to be a leader, which TriCry has been engaging for years. And then if you look at the restaurant and, and food service sector, uh, we've identified several target companies and then the consumer product uh, sector, because palm oil, for example, finds its way to, uh, well beyond um, uh, food to various other uh, sectors. Um, and as, uh, finally, to, to mention the partners, Nadira mentioned that we have several partners we work with, Ceres being uh, a very strong partner, uh, but also the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, we talked about CDP, the round table on sustainable palm oil and sustainable beef, uh, and, and uh, uh, ran the rain, Rainforest uh, Action Network. There were several NGOs that are tracking this and supporting us with data. So uh, this is uh, a new area, and we certainly welcome uh, our members to join in either the existing uh, engagements or 
any new companies or existing companies that you have engagements on other issues. So I'll put it back to you, Nadira. Thanks so much, Frank. And now we'll turn to Marissa Lafave, shareholder advocate at Green Century Capital Management, who will walk us through our approach on food waste. Great, thank you, Natira. Hi, everyone. I will give a brief overview on food waste, why it matters, how we engage companies, and what change is actually being made. So each year, approximately 40% of the food produced in the U.S., which is nearly 133 billion pounds or $165 billion worth, goes uneaten. These are extremely troubling figures when you, when you consider that nearly 5 million Americans, including 16 million children, go to bed hungry each night, and that just a 15% reduction in industrial food waste could generate enough food to feed 25 million pe people each year. Beyond the opportunity to feed the hungry, most, or the lost opportunity to feed the hungry, most food waste goes directly into landfills, where through decomposition, it produces greenhouse gas emissions that are responsible for driving climate change. In fact, food waste in, landfill, in landfills is responsible for 23% of all methane emissions and 4.5% of all US greenhouse gas emissions. So if food waste were actually a country, its emissions would be third behind China and the US. So it's amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Food waste also consumes, as, as you can imagine, 21% of U.S. fresh water, 19% of fertilizer use, and 18% of cropland in the U.S. All of this costs the U.S. economy about $218 billion annually, or about 1.3% of the U.S. GDP. The great thing about food waste and working with it is that it's a win-win situation basically all around. No one's really against reducing food waste. Companies can actually save a lot of money by addressing food waste. For every $1 that companies invest in, in reducing food loss and waste, they can save about $14 on operating costs. And so generally speaking, when we do approach companies on this issue, it's not really too difficult to convince them that it is something that they should work on. So on the next slide, you can see a list of companies that ICTR members are currently engaging with on food waste. I'll just run through quickly, what are we actually asking companies to do on this? Well, the ask is to issue a report on company-wide efforts to assess, disclose, reduce, and optimally manage food waste. And in this, we recommend that the report includes results of audits to determine the causes and quantities and destination of food waste, an estimated cost of purchasing, handling, and disposing of excess food, estimated savings from reducing food waste, prioritization strategies that companies use to reduce food waste, and lastly, time-bound targets to reduce food waste and progress toward meeting these targets. So beyond the very obvious financial risks that food waste poses, uh, poses as well as the several other risks, including reputational, there is actually quite a bit of regulatory risk as well in food waste. State and federal attention to food waste is growing. Um, five states now mandate, actually, that large organic waste generators must divert waste from landfills. And in 2015, the USDA and the EPA established a national food waste reduction goal of 50% by 2030. Because of this, companies are responding. For example, Darden, which owns Olive Garden, Longhorn Steakhouse, and several other large restaurant chains, has begun recycling its organic waste in 41 of its Massachusetts restaurants to comply with new state requirements. The company, therefore, actually estimates that it has the potential to divert 50% of its waste through organics recycling. And um, between 2010 and 2015, Walmart reduced its greenhouse gas emissions in its supply chains by 7 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent through a variety of food waste initiatives. So companies are really starting to recognize the value in reducing food waste and have started implementing food waste reduction initiatives into their long-term strategies, whether those be climate change or um, other community-driven strategies. So for more information on food waste, especially the connection between food waste and what investors can do about it, I recommend that people check out um, a new report that Trillium Asset Management and NRDC put out earlier this year. Lots of really great information on the background of food waste, but as well as how to engage companies on it. It's called Assessing Corporate performance on food waste reduction. And of course, um, any ICCR member who's working on food waste welcomes any, any new member to join our efforts in this area. 
Great. Thanks so much, uh, Marissa. And I also recommend that, that investor document that Trillium and RDC worked on. And we have that available on our ICCR website, both public and the members area. And so now rounding out ICCR's food work, Rabbi Rahel Kontroster, Director of Programs at Trua, the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights, will walk us through how we've been involved with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in asking companies to join their fair food program. Rahel. Thanks, Nadira. And I think this is a really important campaign for ICCR. I think, you know, when we see a lot of corporations, when they talk about, you know, making changes to their supply chains, they're very able to implement changes when it has to do with food safety, things that affect the end consumer, um, or with the quality of their products, but they're unwilling to put in strict controls when it has to do with the people behind the food that we eat every day. Um, suddenly then this becomes an issue of subcontractors or voluntary codes, and yet as people of faith, the most important part of our food chain you know, is, are the people who, who make it, not the products that we consume as consumers. And I think this is where ICCR's impact is really important. Um, ICCR has been involved with CIW for a long time. Many of you may be familiar with the Campaign for Fair Food, which was implemented by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers who are a um, human rights organization made up of workers in Florida's tomato industry, uh, people from Haiti, Guatemala, and Mexico primarily, and they began organizing to change conditions in the tomato fields because Florida used to be known as ground zero for human trafficking in America, and all kinds of human rights abuses were found in the tomato fields. We, most of us eat Florida tomatoes in the winter. Um, problems like wage theft, violence, and an extreme form of um, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and modern day slavery. Um, and what the workers, so the, the Fair Food Program is an example of worker-driven social responsibility, a solution to these supply chain problems developed by the workers themselves with the workers at the lead. But the Fair Food Program is a partnership actually, not just of the workers, but between the growers who eventually after long years of campaign joined the program in 2010 and 14 retail food companies. And it ensures first that workers in these tomato fields are paid a premium that passes straight from the companies to the workers and ensures a more livable wage. It brings their wages from sub-poverty to poverty level wages. And it creates um, verifiable, verif independently verified working conditions for the, uh, for the workers on these farms. It started in Florida and thanks to the participation of Walmart and the program has extended to tomato farms in six states and is also starting to appear in other crops. What makes the fair food program incredibly unique, first of all, is that it's worker driven and that also it has outside monitoring and it is legally binding. A lot of our corporate social responsibility codes are voluntary and that means that companies are encouraged to do good work and many of them do, but the Fair Food Program really creates sort of a carrot and stick approach. You know, it requires that the corporations take responsibility for the human rights abuses that are at the top, that are at the bottom of their supply chain. So it says McDonald's and Yum Brands have responsibilities if workers are abused and that they also have responsibility by putting downward pressure on the prices they pay, they have responsibility for the, debt, for the poverty level wages. So each company that's part of the Fair Food Program pays a premium per pound for Florida tomatoes that gets passed down by the growers directly to the workers. And the companies also agree to cut their purchases. They are legally bound to cut their purchases from any grower that does not comply with the standards of the Fair Food Program, which are monitored by the Fair Food Standards Council. And I think what's really amazing about this program, which has been was implemented in 2011, is that it really has taken this program from a campaign to a human rights prevention program. It's been lauded by the White House and the UN as an anti, as a slavery prevention program. Um, it has helped eliminate um, sexual harassment, sexual assault in the fields against women. It's really changed lives for the tens of thousands of workers who pick tomatoes every day, uh, who pick the tomatoes we eat every day. Um, Tara became involved in this out of our work on human trafficking and because it's been very inspiring for us to take rabbis to visit the CIW, hear about um, the work that they're doing, and then have our rabbis get involved with a campaign. And this is actually really interesting for ICCR's role because there's kind of a little bit of an inside-outside strategy. We're still working to get more corporations to join the program to eliminate the market for Florida tomatoes produced under human rights abuses to allow the program to expand. The more growers and companies that join the program, we can bring, this, we can bring it to scale, we can bring it to other states led by the workers themselves. So there's still the campaign for fair food, 
which is really putting sort of consumer pressure on the companies. It's very activist. We stage protests, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about how that campaign is working in a second. But also, we work with the corporations, you know, by you know, instituting shareholder, you know, shareholder resolutions, for example. And that's where ICCR members have often come in through their outreach to the companies with shareholder letters and um, with shareholder resolutions. And actually, this past year, the Sisters of St. Joseph put a shareholder resolution to Wendy's that was withdrawn um, because of corporate pressure, but it really helped. Then we had um, activist presence at the shareholder meeting where 30 faith leaders and student activists um, actually bought shares. Um, some of the proxies were provided by ICCR members, and they spoke out. And Sister Mary Ellen Gondek was able to speak about why they had then about why the Sisters of St. Joseph had put in their shareholder resolution. So we, we, we use two kinds of pressure. Um, right now, the two major targets that, um, that uh, ICCR members are involved in pressuring are Wendy's and Kroger's. And the major campaign is really against Wendy's, although there's also been shareholder letters and resolutions against Kroger's. Wendy's is the only major um, fast food company that is not part of the fair food program. Um, McDonald's and Burger King and Subway um, are part of it, and Taco Bell was the first company to join. Um, so when we began this campaign against Wendy's in 2013, we thought it would be a relatively easy ask. Um, in the quick service and fast casual industry, being part of the fair food program is now largely standard. In the grocery industry, where we have some members of the fair food program, it's still a little bit of an outlier, except for Walmart. Um, but Wendy's has proved really resistant, and I think the Wendy's campaign is very instructional to us as shareholders. CIW's ask is very specific. Companies will often, in response to CIW, you know, pass resolutions that are more general on farm worker rights or you know, promising to support human rights and supply chains, but those are voluntary and they actually give the company an out, that they don't have to join the fair food program because they've committed to some other code of conduct. And in fact, Wendy's created its own code of conduct, but it's not transparent. Um, there's no worker participation, and they could change their purchases tomorrow, and we wouldn't know what was going on. So when we work with CIW, we have to keep our ask very specific. And that's also instructional to many of us on the various campaigns we work on when we work on community partners. We may want a more general resolution because we want to engage with dialogue with the company, but our partners may have very specific asks, and they may ask us to do things that don't undermine their under-campaign work. And it's, you know, this is why it's important to build relationships with the community groups that we work with. Um, so and I think with Kroger, it's also been, it'll be interesting because, you know, at this point, now that several of their competitors have joined, there will likely be more pressure on Kroger in the future to join. Um, so I really uh, encourage everybody to consider if you hold Wendy's or Kroger's um, to get involved with this, in this work. Um, it's really an important opportunity to see that, you know, to first of all, use be involved in a campaign that's been successful. Um, that has changed lives for so many people. Right now, we're seeing a lot of people in activist communities asking how they can make change without government intervention. And the fact that the CIW and the Fair Food Program have been so effective without the role of the government has been particularly important. Uh, working with CIW gives us hope. And so I hope that many of you, as you become involved with ICCR, will consider becoming involved with this campaign. Great. Thank you so much, Rahel, for, for that overview of our, our work with, uh, with the CIW and the Fair Food Campaign. And now for a newer issue to ICCR, um, immigration. So I wanted to share that we're also integrating questions in our food and labor dialogues tied to U.S. immigration policy. As you can see from this slide and are likely well aware, the American food system relies on immigrant labor more than any other cross-section of the economy. According to the 2014 Hunger Report, over 70% of farm workers are foreign-born, with an estimated half of those undocumented. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that over 10% of restaurant workers are immigrants, with a study by Pew Hispanic finding that at least 20% of all cooks and 28% of all dishwashers are also undocumented. And given today's political climate, um, we are asking of companies in the food sector, how are they assessing the risks from a shift in, in, in immigration policy in their operations and supply chain? How does the new position on immigration affect the company's employees? Its, and its suppliers? And what's the likelihood of disruption in their workforce? Does immigration present any threats to predictability or availability of any of their commodities um, or any of the services that they offer? And is the company assessing the, assessing the welfare of immigrant and migrant workers? Are they covered by the company's policies, for example? Are they receiving trainings and other benefits? And are they being treated um, fairly regardless of their of their immigration status. 
So again, this is a newer um, area of work, and you know we all we all realize that immigration doesn't just um, doesn't just address the uh, the food sector, but multiple sectors. So I think going forward, this will be an issue that we bring to um, bring a human rights lens on and broaden it in terms of um, a program approach. So not just within food, but within uh, multiple areas at ICCR, especially human rights and human trafficking, which is, have been um, doing an ongoing uh, work on, on migrant labor. So before we end our call, there are a couple of other opportunities for you to join work, and some of these works are some of these issues are member led. And so Austin will walk us through some engagements on glyphosate and other pesticides, and then we'll turn back to Marissa, who will share some work on sustainable protein. Two very interesting areas, and we're lucky enough to have um, two resident experts to share with us the work that they've been they've been leading in this area. So Austin, uh, take it away on the glyphosate. Thanks so much, Nandira. Um, so pesticides, uh, and in particular, there's a couple of pesticides we focused on, are um, a major issue in sustainable agriculture and one that some members have felt um, just hasn't had enough attention over the years um, and there's so much room for improvement. Definitely not an easy problem to tackle. Um, one of the pesticides that we've been focused on in particular is glyphosate which is sold by Monsanto as Roundup and also sold by other companies. Uh, I'll also note briefly that pesticide is an umbrella term that includes herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, et cetera. Um, most GMOs are designed to survive direct application of glyphosate, very strong relationship there. It's also increasingly used just before harvest on crops like beans and grains, which is increasing residues in food. And it has come out that Glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. There's been a lot of headlines recently showing uh, Monsanto has been ghostwriting studies, colluding with EPA. There's been a huge controversy over the safety of glyphosate and a lot of other pesticides. Um, and so, as you so has written a report about glyphosate, the link is up on your screen, as you so.org slash glyphosate, uh, called Roundup Revealed, and I encourage you to read the report if you're interested. Neonics, neonicotinoids, are another major class of pesticide that ICCR members have been working on um, with a number of companies. Um, it is one of the biggest factors affecting bee colony collapse and wild pollinator decline. As, as you know, uh, bees and other pollinators have been suffering uh, hugely across the world, especially in Europe and the US in, the, in recent years, and one third of global food production relies on bees and pollinators uh, for it um, you know, to even happen. And so this is a huge issue and we've been working with leading food companies to encourage them to take more leadership on it. In general, thinking about pesticides, we recognize that the United Nations and other experts have said pesticides are not necessary to feed the world. We already produce enough food to feed the world. The pesticide industry engages in unethical marketing these are lightly regulated uh, materials and they're causing a lot of damage uh, to public health and the environment. We have, we work with uh, leaders companies like Kellogg and General Mills, Unilever, Campbell Soup and Cisco, um, focusing on these downstream consumer facing brands, trying to increase their best practices. Uh, and we are also um, engaging companies um, such as Dr. Pepper Snapple, JM Smucker, Ingredient, and PepsiCo. And a lot of these engagements are led by Marissa, who I have the pleasure of working with on a lot of this pesticide work. So if you're interested in getting involved in either of these, uh, please contact one or both of us. And now I'll let Marissa take it away with the sustainable protein work. Thank you. So sustainable protein is really a brand new issue area for investors and is a bit different from many of the issue areas that we work on. It's very forward facing. It's a solutionist engagement in which we ask companies to understand the risks that they're facing and the opportunities that they forego by being overly focused and invested in meat and animal products. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, I'll, I'll kind of dive into a little bit of why this matters, what we're seeing in the market and how it's changing. So modern livestock production or factory farming and the overconsumption of animal products contributes to a host of issues, as I outlined in the slide that you're looking at, which poses financial, reputational, and supply chain risks for companies that are predominantly meat or animal product centric. 
We all saw this um, this year in the JBS scandal, as well as um, in 2015 with the avian flu crisis. So those are just some examples of how risky it really is to be in factory farming and, and a little bit too much in factory farming. So concern over these negative impacts has driven increasing demand for sustainable protein in the past two years beyond just vegans and vegetarians. Since 2010, alternative meat sales have risen 8% annually at twice the rate of processed meat sales. And in 2015, Hampton Creek, which is a plant-based food company, um, most well-known, I think, for their egg-free mayonnaise, became the fastest growing company in history. It is expected that by 2050, alternative proteins will make up one-third of the protein market. So in, sort of, in order to stay in line with these evolving consumer preferences and to take advantage of the, growing, of the growth opportunities in the space, as well as to mitigate the risk from animal production, companies must diversify their protein sources and exposure. Companies like Unilever and Kraft and Tyson Foods have already started recognizing the value in, in doing so and have already begun doing this. For example, um, last year, we filed, Green Century filed a proposal at Tyson on this issue. And Tyson soon after took an ownership stake in a leading plant-based protein producer called Beyond Meat. And a few months later, launched a $150 million venture capital fund focused on alternative protein innovation. Since then, we've heard Tyson, which is one of the largest meat companies in the world, their CEO has been quoted several times saying that meat was no longer the future and that plant protein is. So many huge companies are still heavily reliant on meat and animal products. I mean, almost a lot of these companies, 90% up to 100% of their portfolios are based on animal products. And they have not yet begun to understand the implications of this increasingly risky industry or the many opportunities that are presented by investing in or becoming more active in sustainable protein. So we are th this entire uh, campaign that we have going on on sustainable protein is simply to bring this to light to companies and to engage with them on their long-term protein diversification strategies. And so our ask specifically is for companies to publicly report on the possible risks and challenges that they may face due to the increased prevalence of plant-based eating and any specific steps that the company is taking to address these risks and challenges. If you are interested at all in learning more about this work or you know, be becoming more involved in it, please feel free to reach out to me. I work very closely with FAIR, which is the Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return Initiative based in, out of London, um, who has currently $3.3 trillion of AUM behind their, their work on sustainable protein and on antibiotics. So, Please feel free to reach out to me to learn more. Um, I'd be happy to discuss with you kind of our ideas of uh, what we're planning on doing in this space over the next couple of years. So I'd be happy to talk to anyone. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Marissa. And thank you to, uh, to all our speakers today, to Austin, to Donna, Frank, uh, Marissa, and Rahel for contributing to, uh, to this webinar. As we um, conclude our webinar, I wanted to share with you a few tools and opportunities to join us in this work. So you can see up on our screen here, ICCR Statement of Principles and Practices for uh, Food Production. This was put out a few years ago, so we are working um, to update this document, but still um, you'll find it relevant and useful. So we encourage you to use it in your company engagements um, so that um, the companies can, see, can clearly see what we're seeking of them. Um, use with your networks and allies for the same purpose so that you can share our perspective um, with those groups and with um, with communities that um, that you ally with and organize with so that they can also see our perspective on on food justice again we'll be updating this document so I'll be sure to share that uh, when it's out additionally all of what you've just heard we are incorporating into a food work plan um, for ICCR members so hopefully we'll have that um, at the near final completion by our fall sessions um, September 20 2017. And so you all will see in there a list of resources for each of our issue areas, contact names um, for member leads on that issue area, and the companies will be outlined there as well. So look forward to that. Um, in the interim, a couple of tools um, and resources can be found on the members area under food justice. So if you go to um, the food area and then look under group documents, you can see a listing of our monthly conference call notes, research and resources, and some of our um, documents related to strategy can be found there as well. So how do you get involved? Um, a number of different ways. Use the ICCR database to see who's doing what at where, um, and feel free to sign up. 
join our monthly conference calls. Here's a schedule of our upcoming calls. And if you sign up to the food area on the members website, you'll get alerted to um, these calls with the agenda and the call in information. We encourage you all to just jump in, you know, the best way is to learn by doing. So jump in, sign up to a, a few engagements. Um, you can be on for, you know, the first one just in the listening mode and then ratchet up your participation as time goes on. Um, but the best way really is to, to jump in and get to know your colleagues in this work. They're, they're ready to, to help you. So um, hence the buddy up there, you know, just uh, reach out um, with a lead and ask them to show you the ropes, call a staff member who can also do the same for you and talk more about the background on these issues and ways in which um, you can get involved, whether there's new opportunities, um, new companies that, that which we're seeking leads, or if you have a portfolio of companies and you're trying to figure out what to do with, um, with those companies. So lots of ways to get involved and we hope that um, by this conversation, you've learned a lot about, um, about the issues and, and you'll feel more comfortable jumping in. So as you can see, I kind of um, lied when I said that we were narrowing the focus a bit. There's a lot to cover here um, in the food work, but all very, very exciting work. So on this slide, you get a quick snapshot of levels of ways to participate in this exciting work. Um, you can be a lead, you can be active in joining these engagements, you can just be interested and get communications about it or action alerts. And as Rahel had said, um, you can lend your proxies or serve as a liaison to community groups um, on this issue as well and bring them into the ICCR fold. So we have um, very little time for, for questions, but if you do have questions and are able to stay on the line, I encourage you to do so um, and we'll take them as, as they come in. And uh, folks have been asking in the question box whether the slides will be available and an archive of the webinar. They surely will. So after we end today, I will send you a recording of the webinar along with the slides. And then again, later on in a few weeks, look out for, for the work plan, which will give uh, another comprehensive picture of, of where we are in this work. And so um, Rahel, if you're able to stay on, there was a question around um, the CIW efforts. Sure. Um, and whether the CIW has made any progress in expanding beyond tomatoes and beyond Florida? So that's a great question. Definitely beyond Florida. Um, as part of the Walmart agreement, um, any, it was very, very specific. So any Florida grower who sells to Walmart also had to agree to let the fair food program into their, the rest of their East Coast supply chain. Plus there was one additional grower who doesn't sell to Walmart, who had already done so voluntarily. So we've now seen the Fair Food Program expand to six states up the East Coast for the past two seasons. And you see the same things you see under the Fair Food Program, um, worker to worker education in the fields, uh, monitoring um, both announced and unannounced by the Fair Food Standards Council. And that's really been successful. It's brought the program, you know, the two new workers who are then also, I think one of the things that's great about the, the program because workers are educated on their rights, um, they then begin to ask other rights of why they don't have those rights in other crops, and it begins to change what their expectations are. It makes tomatoes the, the crop of choice. Um, and so that's been really amazing to see how the CAW has brought this up the East Coast. Um, they have also been piloting um, another crop in Florida, um, and they've been piloting strawberries, um, and specifically through Pacific Tomatoes, um, who we see under Sunripe brands. And those have been available mostly in the Southeast. Um, I think that's a really great way to build the program because it's taking existing growers and encouraging them to apply this to other products on their farms. Um, and I know that there have been discussions with Walmart about, uh, about other products as well. Um, and now the trick is to try and create that buy-in among other companies and also you know, ensure that when new companies join the Fair Food Program that the, the agreements extend be beyond Florida tomatoes. Great. Thanks so much, Rahel. And there was a question around, has the, uh, the current U.S. administration stepped up deportation in the ag sector? And I think there's been some articles that have cited um, some raids. Um, there's some in New York on the East Coast and in, in California as well um, in terms of, um, you know, raids on farms and um, undocumented workers um, being taken in. And um, you know, what I'm reading also is the, the fear of workers, right, um, on these fields, and especially so if they're facing human rights abuses. So now there's a fear of just complaining because they don't know if their employers will, will report them and then they'll, they'll be deported. On the flip side, of course, there are these farmers who are worried about um, their labor supply chain um, and are participating um, 
in policy by calling on their congressional leaders and other and others to uh, to safeguard their their labor force. Um, so lots of there's lots of ongoing work on immigration. We're trying to follow it closely, and we have a working group that's de dedicated to immigration. So if you're interested in that issue, you can sign up on the members area, and we do have uh, regular calls there as we try to outline our strategy on the issue. Um, so look look for that. Um, so I think that's that's all we have time for um, today. Um, but again, if you have further questions on this program, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I will be sure to, uh, to walk you through our, our food work. So thanks all for participating on our webinar today. Um, and hopefully we get to work with you all in the future. Thanks everyone. And thanks especially to our members who've contributed on the webinar. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.